All right, the musculoskeletal system. Musculoskeletal, we're talking about our muscles and our bones. First thing to delve into with this is the anatomy of a muscle. In anatomy section of this course, you are gonna cover all the different muscles on the body. Well, all of those muscles are made up of multiple, multiple muscles or muscle groups. Within that, you've got the fascicle, the muscle fiber, the myofibril, the sarcomere, and myofilaments. So, not just a biceps. You, within that biceps, you've got two heads. Within that, each one of those is a group of fascicles. So you've got this whole bicep right here. Then within that, you've got a clump. That clump is made up of a muscle fiber. Muscle fibers, all those dots within this little segment right here are muscle fibers. So each fascicle is made up of muscle fibers. On top of that, each muscle fiber is made up of myofibrils, a whole nother string of muscle tissue. Now, that muscle fibril, as it runs down, is a long string of something that we call sarcomeres. Sarcomere is where the magic happens. That is where the muscle moves. I'll go into a little bit more on the next slide on this, but know that a muscle is comprised of bundles of fascicles. Those fascicles are made up of muscle fibers. Those muscle fibers have myofibrils. And at the myofibril level is where muscular contraction happens through the sarcomeres. So you've got a long fiber, each of which is broken into sarcomeres. Those sarcomeres have myofilaments. The most popular, well-known myofilaments are actin and myosin. Now, how we believe in modern science that muscular contraction works is through what we call the sliding filament theory. Sliding filament theory happens at, a, at the level of the sarcomere through different actions of contractile proteins, actin and myosin. Actin and myosin, myosin we refer to as the thick filament, actin is referred to as the thin. They are both contractile proteins that make up a sarcomere. So in this diagram right here, there's a sarcomere next to a sarcomere, next to a sarcomere, next to a sarcomere. And the line of sarcomeres makes up that myofibril, which makes up a muscle fiber, which makes up a fascicle, which makes up a muscle. So at this level, your myosin, the thick filament, and the actin, the thin filament, form what we call cross bridges. And the actin slides together, meeting in this midpoint to contract and relax. Closing together, opening back up to shorten and lengthen the muscle to cause movement. To shorten for my bicep to pull my forearm up, relax, to let it lower down. As I said, we call this the sliding filament theory. The myosin, the thick filament, actin, the thin filament. Remember, they form cross bridges. And the sliding over of the two represents a fully, contra fully contracted muscle. When they meet and they cross over the, mid, the M line, it's a fully contracted muscle. If they only come closer, it's a partially contracted muscle. Now, how does that muscle actually contract? We talked about the nervous system. We talked about how our body is innervated through uh, a, a maze series of nerves that spin off of our brain and spinal cord. Well, those nerves get transmit or get signals from the brain, send them out, and then off of the nerves, 
are bundles of things called motor units. It's the functional unit of a muscle. A motor unit is what makes the muscle contract and relax. It receives those impulses to contract. It receives impulses to relax. Now each muscle, and by muscle, each muscle head, each part of a muscle group is comprised of thousands of motor units. Now, depend, it's not proportional to the size of the muscle, the number of motor units. The number of motor units has to do with the function of that muscle. So, one motor unit will come in and innervate, that means supply those impulses, multiple muscle fibers. So there's, mul there's, there's lots of motor units per muscle. There's lots of muscle fibers that make up a muscle. Those muscle fibers depends on what their job is, how many, of a mus how many muscle fibers are part of each motor unit. I have on here the example of the eyes versus the quadriceps versus the fingers. Our eyes do so many different things, focusing, always changing, blinking, moving. It's very intricate. What we're able to do with our hands, still very intricate, a little less. It's not, you know, a finger movement isn't also as innate as a blink, as what we have to do with our eyes. We don't, we don't focus our eyes like you do a lens on a camera. Our quadriceps, our quadriceps have you know, one job. Our quadriceps extend our knee joint. There's no, there's, there's no magic. There's a lot of muscle. There's a lot of force that happens. But in terms of the actual movement itself, not as intricate as the eyes and the fingers. So it needs less muscle fiber. I mean, it has more muscle fibers per motor unit. Now, our muscles. Our body is made up of all these different muscles, muscle groups. Well, of each muscle, there's different fiber types. And those three fiber types that we have determine what that muscle is capable of on a performance level, on a functional level. The three names, slow oxidative, fast oxidative, and fast glycolytic. Those three fiber types have distinct differences and distinct abilities. The main difference between them is their endurance and how they are fueled. Now, slow twitch muscles, it doesn't mean you're slow. They just mean that they have the ability to work aerobically. They are, they are fed with a capillary bed that's constantly supplying them with oxidated blood. So with this, all this oxygen coming in, they are able these muscles have the ability to use aerobic energy systems. Because of the blood coming through, they are red in color. And because they are aerobic, they are more fatigue resistant and adaptable to endurance activities. Everybody, everybody's body has all three kinds of muscle fibers. It's the proportion of the muscles, of the muscle fibers, that differ, that's different between each individual. And that's what makes one individual good in certain areas. And, and it's not just a muscle, it's not just a person as a whole. One person may have a different proportion in a certain muscle group than another person. So it's even more specific than just from person to person. So these are your endurance, slow twitch are your endurance fibers marathon, distance runners, you would assume genetically they have a higher proportion of slow twitch muscle fibers. Next are the fast twitch, we also call them type 2A, slow twitch or type 1. They are an intermediate fiber. They have endurance properties and they have power and speed properties. They can contract rapidly, but they can also rely on oxygen for energy. 
It's a large fiber. It's got good oxidative properties, and it also has glycolytic. So it can be fast, and it can last a long time. Color-wise, we're talking about gray. Have some blood, but not, but not the only way that it works. Now, the, the fast twitch type 2B, these are anaerobic muscles. These do not use oxygen. If there's not oxygen, you can also guarantee that they're using carbohydrates. If you want to look at it from a fuel source, which means they're going to depend on glycogen and glucose. But, mo but mainly glycogen. They are highly fatigued and lactic acid builds up easily because it's an anaerobic muscle fiber. They are white in color, they hardly get any blood, and they are terrible for aerobic activities, but for your power, for your speed, for your sprinting, your jumping, your strength, these are the muscles that, that the people that excel in those areas, if you do that type of activity, that's what your body's relying on in, at that time. Now, we, all, we have all three of these muscles. Our body recruits them in a certain order, starting with the small type 1 muscles. They're small. They don't need blood. They don't need anything stored in them for energy. They rely on, they rely on the capillaries for that. So the small type 1 muscles are recruited first, followed by the larger type 2 fibers recruited later when needed because the effort has increased. Just in terms of why, why we broke it down into size, type 2 fibers are larger. They are twice the size of your small muscle fibers. If you think of just the difference in physique of people that are endurance versus people that are power and speed, that explains a lot right there, the difference in their body types, why they, are, they excel in certain athletic endeavors. As I mentioned, everybody has all three kinds of muscle, and every body, body has in each muscle all three muscles, all three types. It's just the proportion that varies. So each muscle has all three kinds. Now, how we live our life in childhood determines a lot of how these fibers are distributed, but the type that we get is primarily genetic. Two good words to know when we're talking about the musculoskeletal system, hypertrophy and atrophy. Hypertrophy is increasing, or I'm sorry, it is an adaptation to training. It's an increase in the size and the strength of a muscle, not the number of, the, of cells or fibers. It, is, it, it directly relates to the size of the muscle. Now, atrophy is a response to inactivity, to not training anymore, to sedentarism. Atrophy is a decrease in the size of the muscle fiber. Atrophy and hypertrophy. How a muscle hypertrophies, it's overloaded. It goes through a certain amount of effort, it masters that level of effort, and then it approaches a new level, a higher, a harder level of effort. It's stressed. Under that stress, our muscle fibers incur what we call microtrauma. It's that microtrauma that increases the size and the power and the force that we see from training. Now, when in, when in talking about hypertrophy, there are two forms of hypertrophy. There is sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, and there is myofibrillar hypertrophy. Now, a sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is a nervous system response. It is your body responding to the microtrauma, the tiny tears in your fiber, is responding to that microtrauma and trying to repair itself. It's like when someone, when you twist your ankle and your ankle begins to swell, fluid has rushed to help, to, to, to help protect the injury. 
myofibrillar hyper, hypertrophy, that is an actual increase in the number and the size of the myofibrils. Remember, not the, not the muscle fiber, it's about the myofibrils. The myofibrils make up the muscle fiber. So you can increase that number, and that number, that increased number of myofibrils, that increased size of each myofibril is what makes the muscle fiber, and all those increased in size muscle fibers is what's making that bicep bigger for all of those curls that you did. There's also an increase in the actin and myosin, which you remember are part of the sarcomere and what makes muscular contraction happen. I'm gonna skip ahead to types of contractions, starting with believe the isotonic. Isotonic means same tension. So that is me doing a bicep curl and we've got a five pound weight. I could totally curl more than that, but I'll use five pounds in this example because it looks like five pounds. So five pounds starting here, moving that weight up, decreasing the angle of the joint the muscle length changes. There's a contraction in the muscle. The muscle length changes, but the load never changes. It is five pounds the whole way. Now you'll see in the other examples why that is important. When you're talking about an isotonic contraction, there's the concentric phase and the eccentric phase. The concentric phase is when the muscle shortens against the force. The eccentric phase is when the muscle lengthens. Concentric shortens, eccentric lengthens in the direction of the force. Know that, keep that clear in your brain so you don't confuse yourself. Concentric contraction, the muscle shortens as it moves against the force. Eccentric lengthens in the direction of the force. So it's lengthening with the pull of the force. Isometric, iso still meaning same, metric meaning measure. It's a static contraction. That is me just standing here flexing my muscle or tightening up. I am it's a type of contraction that doesn't involve a concentric or eccentric contraction. I'm not shortening or lengthening my muscle. So it's still a force, a type of contraction. There's just no concentric or eccentric phase of that contraction. So the muscle stays the same length. We also refer to this as a static contraction. Isokinetic is the same motion. In this, the muscle generates the maximum amount of force throughout the entire movement. What we're talking about here is that gravity does not come into play when you're talking about an isokinetic contraction. It means that you are moving the same amount regardless of your movement. You are pushing against a force and resisting a force same amount the entire time doing the same motion. In this versus isometric, there are concentric and eccentric contractions because the muscle is shortening and lengthening. And that's the end.